as someone who sort of you know thinks about energy and environmental pro economics and energy and environmental problems all the time, but you know I think yeah it's sort of easy to sort of think about these problems in a way that's you know particularly when you combine it with economics, which is already known as the dismal science as, as it is, it's easy to kind of bring yourself down every day when you sort of take a look at the problems that we face. But nonetheless, I wholeheartedly agree with what the congressman said about uh, the fact that, you know, getting legislation like this passed, A, it's incredibly important. B, you know, the door's never completely closed, and part of what we try to do here at Harris, both on the research side and on the and on the teaching side, is sort of tee up people with sort of the skills, the science, and the know-how to actually enact po positive change. So where we're going to go with this session going forward is that myself, uh, Fiona Burlig, an assistant professor here at Harris, and then Amir Gina, um, another assistant professor here at Harris um, are going to talk about research areas that are important to us related to energy and environmental economics and policy. And then in the remaining time that we have left, we'll have a little bit of, uh, we'll hopefully have some time for Q&A before we turn it over to Michael Greenstone for an for energy and environmental lab, uh, lab session. So an, a way we often think about energy and environmental policy here at Harris and more broadly at the University of Chicago in part through the Energy Policy Institute at Chicago Epic is that we see the energy challenge is really coming down to two issues. One, very much along the lines of what Congressman Quigley was speaking about, simply relates to the fact that energy consumption Tends to, re tends to generate environmental harm, perhaps most saliently CO2 emissions and climate change, um, but also sort of local air pollution, water pollution, noise disruption, health hazards, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, it turns out that consuming energy is something that people kind of like to do. It's nice to have the lights on. It's nice that people can drive here or fly here or that this microphone's working. The list goes on and on. And the question becomes, how do we trade these two things off? And in my mind, and in kind of aligned with my own research, at least in the United States context, context one of the recent, a recent development that probably encapsulates this trade-off probably more saliently than anything else is what's been happening with, uh, with, with shale oil and gas in the, in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to step away and use the hand mic as I get closer to my slides. Uh, so as you may know, shale oil and shale gas production have taken off tremendously in the United States over the past 10, 15 years or so. So what I'm showing here is a graph recently put out by the Energy Information Administration, the EIA, showing the tremendous surge in shale natural gas production from 2004 through roughly today. What do you want to take away from this? If you look at 2004, the U.S. was producing something on the order of 50 billion cubic feet of natural gas today, a little less than what was consumed in the country at the time. We were actually importing a fair bit of natural gas from Canada. All of that natural gas was being produced from sort of quote unquote conventional natural gas formations. So things like sandstone and limestone where an oil or gas firm could drill a vertical well down and gas would start flowing and you didn't need to do a whole lot else to it. What happened that, that led to the development of shale? Well, it was basically a partnership between one particularly entrepreneurial firm in Texas, Mitchell Energy, and a partnership between Mitchell and the Department of Energy, which had a large grant-making program about developing unconventional oil and gas resources and threw a lot of money into this endeavor. And with a lot of work and a lot of trial and error and a lot of really hard science, in the Barnett Shale in Texas, they finally figured out how to use high volume hydraulic fracturing, basically pumping millions upon millions of gallons of water, millions and millions of pounds of sand into shale formations that bore a lot of gas, but we otherwise didn't know how to get the stuff out of the ground. They perfected this technology in Texas. It soon spread to a bunch of other parts of the country, um, Colorado, Louisiana, Pennsylvania in particular. So Pennsylvania, this green wedge, is now the number one natural gas producing state in the country. Basically, as recently as 15 years ago, Pennsylvania basically produced nothing. Um, and now we're sort of, the US is in a position where we're you know, producing 90 billion cubic feet a day 
exporting some of that to other countries as well. So a complete turnaround in the gas situation. So a massive expansion of gas production in the US. The numbers here are incredible. Very similar story on oil. Once they figured out how to do this for shale gas, people said, oh, we can get oil this way too. Started going for that around 2008, 2010. US oil production has now more than doubled. The US is now the number one oil producer in the world. We've passed Saudi Arabia. We've passed Russia. This is just absolutely transformative. We're now sort of no longer a net hydrocarbons importer. We're a net exporter. Something like, you know, you look at someone from the oil industry 15 years ago and dragged them here and told them this, they'd think you were absolutely nuts. So this has been hugely transformative in terms of production, which has led to a bunch of questions about sort of how do we think about the economic and policy impacts of this. And there's a bunch of different layers to this that myself and a bunch of other scholars both here at Chicago and elsewhere in the US and the world have thought really hard about how to think Think about this. So on one hand, if you think about really locally where shale oil and gas development is happening, this is a picture of a shale gas drilling site in Pennsylvania, sort of rural Pennsylvania, that's actually a prison in the background, if you can make it out. Um, these are really big industrial operations that oftentimes are happening in areas that are not used to having big industrial operations. They're handling water. They're handling, handling nasty chemicals, both chemicals that go into the ground as part of frac fluid and stuff that comes from 10,000 feet down that's usually buried way down there. We don't have to worry about it. But at the same time, you know, there's a bunch of industrial activity going on here. There's a bunch of gas being produced. There's a bunch of jobs here. There's a bunch of capital here. How do we think about all of this and how do we trade all that off? So there's a very local element to what goes on here. If you think sort of bigger picture about just the overall US natural gas balance, there's been a ma massive change in US oil and gas markets, a massive decrease in the price of natural gas, which means if you want to heat your home, you don't have to pay as much money. Consumers kind of like that. But at the same time, we're producing more gas. That's more CO2. How do we think about those two things? And then on top of that, there's a whole host of transportation issues. Remember from those graphs, where's shale oil and gas coming out of the ground? It's coming from places like West Texas, rural Pennsylvania, western North Dakota. These aren't exactly places full of consumers who want to burn oil and natural gas. There's no refineries there. There's not a lot of, not a lot of households. If you're going to produce this stuff and use it and make money, you got to get it somewhere, which means you either need to build a pipeline or, more recently, if you're talking about oil anyway, put it on mile-long trains full of oil and put it on the rails and ship it? And how do these things trade off? And this is sort of, I've laid out a few questions here. This is probably just scraping the surface of the questions you might ask about what's happening with shale, oil, and gas. Um, and I'll touch on a few of them to try and illustrate some of the trade-offs we face between sort of the pure raw private economic benefits of actually producing this stuff and having low cost and available and secure energy versus the environmental and health consequences that, the, that this creates and how we might think about policy that deals with them. So in terms of just sort of like the big picture, what does this mean in terms of overall markets and how, to, how might you feel about, say, the shale gas revolution if you're a consumer? Katie and Hausman and I wrote a paper a couple years ago that tried to draw out like what's the supply, overall supply and demand picture for shale gas, for natural gas in the United States. And basically what we did in that paper was sort of looked in aggregate about what's happening with supply and demand. What's the extent to which shale gas has really pushed out supply? That's the orange line in this graph. And what has that meant in terms of lower gas prices, basically a 50% cut in the natural gas price you see as consumers in the US? And what has that actually meant in terms of dollars if you're a person in the US consuming natural gas and you add all that up and basically what's that worth to you? You can say what you can decide for yourself if this is big or little, but it adds up to about 230 bucks a person per year, about a third or a half percentage point of, point of GDP. You can call that big, you can call that small, but these are sort of real tangible you know, economic benefits of all this natural gas that we're producing. But of course, all that natural gas is being consumed. It's also being burned. What happens when you burn gas? You make CO2. You also might have some methane emissions. How do you weigh that against it? You need a cost or a valuation 
to sort of harness sort of what do we think the social cost of that is. This is a project that Amir works, Amir and Michael Greenstone work on. They'll be speaking later. If you throw, say, a $40 per ton value on the price of carbon, your own valuation might be higher, it might be lower. That potentially offsets, depending how much methane leakage you think is actually going on, a non-trivial share of what these consumer benefits are. And that's sort of just the sort of the big large-scale aggregate natural gas market picture. If you think about what's happening with the local, our local community, so here's a zoomed-in picture of that same fracking site in Pennsylvania I was pointing at earlier. What's happening there? Well, if you happen to be one of these incredibly lucky people that was sitting on top of a shale gas reservoir and you actually own the mineral rights to that gas, this is just a massive cash windfall bonanza for you. It means the drilling company is going to come buy the rights to drill from you if they drill and successfully find stuff, which of course they did. This means you get big royalty checks. There's a nice paper by some folks at the Kansas City and Dallas Federal Reserve that sort of add all that up and come out with, in just one year alone, 2014, those royalty checks added up to 40 billion bucks. Like pure cash windfall for people who happen to have their homes or ranches or property, whatever, in the right place at the right time. On top of that, there's sort of a whole host of local economic change that goes on. You think about sort of western North Dakota, extremely rural, one of the least populated parts of the entire United States. Parts of North Dakota get flooded with oil workers coming up from Texas. They build these things called man camps to house all these people. So this is a new word that was developed in the US starting around 2011, man camp, uh, which makes it sound really appealing. Um, and Michael Greenstone, along with other researchers at Dartmouth in a separate paper, sort of document, what, as you might expect, big increases in local wages, huge increases in property values, even independent of the royalty checks that you get. Government net revenues go up, both from taxes, although expenses for things like road repair are also going up. So you have all these trade-offs, which I haven't even gotten into the health effects yet. You tend to think most of these are good, but they're not necessarily good for everybody, right? If you think of, say, a fix, somebody on a fixed income renting property in rural North Dakota, happily living, living out the sunset of their lives, all of a sudden fracking comes along, their property gets worth more, the rents go up, they're on fixed income, they don't happen to own the minerals. Even though there's sort of prosperity happening all around them, these are people who wind up actually cons potentially considerably worse off as a result of this. So even from an economic perspective, not all is necessarily well here. Um, come on. There's another slide here somewhere. Here, I'll hand this off, but I'll keep talking. Thanks. Um, on top of that, there's sort of, you know, a long line of potential for negative health effects from this, both at a local level and then, of course, at a global level from, from carbon emissions. Um, some of that, there's a long litany of concerns, a lot of which is starting to have evidence behind it now. Michael Greenstone and co-authors, for instance, have a paper that document adverse health effects for infants that are born really, really close, that whose whose mothers live really close to a shale site. Um, there's some evidence beginning to emerge about local water pollution as a possible, as a possible, me as a possible mechanism for this. Um, and you know, there are players in the oil and gas industry who you know, have a history of not necessarily being, cl being clean actors. Thanks. So what this is all potentially setting up, you might think you're in a world where, all right, there's a bunch of economic and private sort of positives that come out of shale, oil, and gas. We can add those up. Maybe we can sort of do the other thing, add up all the environmental harms, weigh one against the other, see which is bigger, and then hand that off to someone, some policymaker to decide, OK, do we want to ban fracking or not? That sort of might be an instinctive way to think about sort of documenting what all these different values are. I would argue that's the wrong way to think about the question. What do we want here? Ideally, we want to sort of you know, harness some of the economic benefits that come from shale, cheaper energy, more accessible energy, while thinking about policies that minimize environmental harms. 
Someone that comes from regulation and sort of you know technology standards. Some of that comes, and this is sort of the Chicago School economics. How do we give firms an incentive to actually self-regulate and avoid causing harms in the first place? One way you might think about doing that is just making firms directly liable for any damages that they cause. If you have a spill that causes health effects or just environmental damages, pay for it, for instance. If you drill a well, you're going to have to pay to clean up that well once the well's productive life is over. And we just make firms liable. And in most states, firms are indeed liable for damages that they cause, either directly by state suit or by private citizen action. You know, if, a firm harm, if an oil and gas firm harms you, you are completely entitled to sue them and potentially win in court. A big traditional barrier to doing that in the industry, though, um, has been the fact that oil and gas firms are very good at using small limited liability companies to basically sort of create firms that have very small asset levels so that they can then use bankruptcy to escape these sorts of problems. So for instance, let's see, I'm not sure how the, yeah. They're not advancing. Um, all right, so the, the story I wanted to tell is a story about an oil and gas company, and I'll wrap up shortly, that has the unfortunate name of literally the good old boys oil and gas company. <laughs> <laughs> this is not made up. This is totally true. This is an oil and gas company in Texas, because where else, um, that basically the, rail, the RRC, the main enforcer in Texas, basically documented in 2000, in the year 2000, that these jokers basically left five walls that weren't properly plugged, usable quality, wa usable quality water in the area is likely to be contaminated by migrations or discharges of salt water and other oil and gas wells. All right, here's some bad actors. What do we want to do? We should make them pay for that. So then more text about to come, maybe. Oh boy, we have to go back and forth every time. Oh, this will work, good. So. Ah, basically, shortly thereafter, the Texas Attorney General, they get sued, the state of Texas wins, we're gonna charge them $200,000. Seems like a lot of money, great, win-win. But the money never shows up. They go after them, go after them, they're incredibly difficult to find, and by the time 2005 rolls around, it becomes clear that the good old boys oil company no longer exists, no longer has any assets. They're able to completely walk away. All this is to say that you know, thinking about regulation and liability just on their own aren't enough to solve the problem. But we need a sort of smart policy that, take, that sort of takes into account the fact that firms have this ability, in this case using bankruptcy, to escape effective regulation. What does that look like in this case? Judd Boomhauer, Lucas Davis, and others have done some really nice work that documents sort of the power of upfront liability bonds in this industry to help put a limit to exactly this behavior. So this is a graph from Judd's paper that basically sort of graphs over time sort of the rates at which sort of firms exit the Texas oil and gas industry. What did Texas do in 2002? In part, in, the, in response to bad actors like the good old boys oil company, really toughened up bonding requirements in 2001. This basically said, yeah, right, you want to drill a well in Texas? You're going to have to put up $50,000 up front, tie it up in an escrow account, and you only get that money back when the well is done and properly plugged and abandoned. And of course, what do you see? You see a bunch of the good old boy oil companies decide as this bonding requirement takes effect, I don't really want to be in this business anymore. And the paper does a really nice job of documenting that these are the small firms, these are the firms that are associated with spills and accidents. So sort of really sort of the way I, the route I see for effective policy in this, in this particular space, whether it's about um, liability, whether it's about regulating pipelines, whether it's about crude by rail, is sort of carefully thinking about sort of what are firms incentives here if I try to tax or try to regulate one particular activity, 
how is that going to lead to sort of reactions in, in, in other spaces? So for instance, sort of another a paper that Tom Covert, my colleague at the Booth School of Business and Epic Affiliate have worked on, tries to understand trade-offs between sort of shipping crude by rail versus shipping crude by pipeline. And one of the things that we document is that both pipelines and rail have adverse effects um, on local environmental outcomes. Pipelines can spill. Railroads can, crude by rail can have accidents, plus locomotives themselves are dirty. But if you only push down on one of those, you necessarily get more, you necessarily get more of the other. So, you know, the story we're trying to tell here is not just sort of a pure trade-off between, you know, private benefits of oil and gas on one hand versus environmental impacts on the other. The question is sort of what are smart policies that actually give incentives to firms to actually do the right things in terms of the environment while still sort of trying to maximize the gains we get from the energy itself. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to Fiona.